I don't know. I, I guess it's fair. Um, I've been involved in open source now uh, since uh, early 2000, 2001, so uh, 19, nearly 20 years. And um, <coughs> I'm, I'm really passionate about it. I, it's at the end of a long day, so I don't look that passionate. And I'm between you and the cocktails as well, which is another challenge. But I am genuinely passionate about it. And, you know, it's interesting. We've had a number of our VCs, investors, other companies say to us, you know, why, why don't you s switch out of open source? You know, why are you still open source? And there was definitely a while... Oh, my slide's going to come up at some point. I, I hope so. <laughs> ah, thank you. <coughs> it's th 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 someone decided they should be closed and, uh, and out and <laughs> completely non-transparent. So, uh, and and we we believe that the open source is more than just a, a license model. It's more than just a code. It's absolutely central to the way we operate and to our value proposition to you. So that's, I'm not going to take long, but that's really the, the thesis of this talk, and, uh, and it'll be quite quick. So we've talked multiple times about disaggregation uh, throughout, the, throughout the day. And, of course, what disaggregation is really talking about is having different organizations, whether it's different divisions in your, in your team, or whether it's different businesses, or whether it's different you know, parts of government, or whether it's c consumers whether it's app developers, and they typically are talking through APIs. We're talking about integration, and of course, we've talked about identity. We've just heard about that. And this disaggregation requires all of these things to work well across boundaries. And how does that happen? You know, this is exactly what we've just been hearing about all day. It happens through open standards, and that's how we formed WSO2. That's why we started the company. We felt that open standards were creating a different way of building systems that was all about open networking, about building applications that are, that are distributed across the network. And fundamentally, <coughs> you know, me and Sanjeeva were at IBM, and we were involved in, for instance, adding the first SOAP support to WebSphere. And what that was was a layer on top of J2EE and EJBs. And EJBs was a layer on top of Corba, and Corba was a layer on top of Java Beans. And, and this layering seemed to be like, every time you added something, you, you made the thing more complex and, and, and more heavyweight. And we felt that open standards were an opportunity to say, we can cut out a lot of that legacy and build something smaller, lighter, cleaner that just worked. So open standards are absolutely vital to this. But it's not just open standards. We think that the transparency of openness creates a different environment for us to work. So how many of you have looked at the WSO2 source code? Anyone? Excellent. How many of you have looked at source code of other open source projects? Yes. How many of you actually loaded it into a debugger to help you figure out what's happening? There we go. Awesome. See, this is instantly changing the way you interact with a piece of software. You have a problem, you know, and, and obviously we're very proud of our support, and I hear it over and over again, customers and, and partners telling us our support is great. But sometimes you don't want to phone up support. You just want to find what, what's happening here. You load up the source code into the debugger, you're away. Now, of course, with Java, you can decompile it, but that's kind of painful. You lose a lot of the actual semantic data. You don't get all the comments. So, mm, and it's potentially illegal as well, yes, depending on your jurisdiction and the source code and the license and everything else. I mean, another example is performance testing. We used to publish performance tests, and all the licenses, all the click-through licenses for BEA, WebLogic, and WebSphere, and all the things we wanted to performance test against, say you cannot run performance tests on this. You cannot publish any performance data. So we would say, well, you know, we are better than a leading ESB because we couldn't name them because you know, it's illegal. So there's this transparency of the, of the code. That's IP transparency. But there's also transparency of how we run things. And this is about letting people become committers. This is about 
how the, the code gets pulled in, and I'm going to talk about that. And then we're also very keen on operational transparency. So as Devika said, we're a private company, but we're publishing financial figures. We think we have fair business terms. We're very open about our business model. We're very open about what we think we're doing, and, and we think all of this is important. And this all helps build an ecosystem. So I'm sure many of you know this, but there's really two forms of open source license. There's what are called permissive licenses and copyleft licenses. So permissive licenses basically say you can do what you like as long as you acknowledge this is open source. And, and sometimes they have one little thing in there which says if you sue us for a patent violation, then we, r we take away, you know, then you can't use our patents. Do you know what I mean? You can't use our IP if you sue us for your IP. So some, t some licenses have that one restriction, which is you can use it as much as you like as long as you pay play fair. The copy left, the GPL or AGPL and various other ones are much more viral. The basic idea here is that if you write code that extends this open source or you change it, you also have to make your code open source. And this was uh, where a lot of fear of open source came from initially because a lot of people were like, oh my God, I, if I do anything o with open source, I have to be open source. And that's not true. The copyleft is a very specific approach and, and I have no problem with it. I think it's, it's, a, you know, it's a good license for early projects. It's a good license for some things, but it's not what WSO2 has chosen. We've chosen the permissive approach. We're very free and open and we've, you know, as you, we saw that this morning, didn't we? Devika asked, how many people are using WSO2 without a, a contract? And lots of you put your hands up and Devika may want to come and hunt you down, but there's nothing he can do, you know. You're free to use our <laughs> stuff openly. That's a part of our, that's part of our open model. And then I also want to make another distinction between open source and open core. So, for example, Fordrock and MuleSoft took the model that they were going to make the very core of the system open, but all the good bits, the clustering, the high availability, the tooling, maybe the documentation, those aspects are not open. And Fordrock's done this with a license called CDDL, which is actually even worse because it's not really a permissive license. It's somewhere, somewhere between a permissive and a, and a copyleft license. It basically says you can't really use this for commercial stuff. And the problem with open core is I think it's, it's, it has a half-life. It actually starts out pretty well. You get a community project and you get, in, you get people contributing to it. But over time, those contributions drop off because the real use of it all moves to the, to the proprietary license. And I think we really saw that with MuleSoft. I know MuleSoft quite well because they're a competitor of ours. You know, it had a very vibrant community to start with and that community's kind of died away. Open source, the business model that, that us and Red Hat and other more pure open source models use is basically to say you get a subscription. So the code is open, but we try and provide value with a subscription. And I'll explain what that value is. And, and why do I think open source is important? I think it, it changes the, the, the model in lots of ways. So firstly, it frees you up from vendor lock-in. It lets you load the source up into your debugger and, and make changes. It lets you contribute code back and say, well, actually, I found a problem. We publish our roadmaps openly, and so you can go on and see our roadmaps and say, actually, I really like that feature, but I'd also like this. It certainly, I think, speeds up velocity of innovation. We use a lot of other open source. That speeds us up. We uh, compete with a lot of open source. That speeds us up. And it just gives us... So, for example, a lot of our customers complain to me. They say, Paul, you've done too many releases, and I'm, I'm not keeping up with you. You're I'm, I'm having trouble... Uh, upgrading all these releases, especially Identity Server, which has done like seven releases in 18 months. Um, <coughs> so we tried to solve that with this WSO2 Update Manager, which helps automate the updates 
and automate your testing and deployment of those. And we do a lot of work on making sure there's backwards compatibility and, and migration scripts and so forth. But, but we don't want to slow down our velocity. Uh, we think that, uh, but I think that the biggest thing I think is important is, you know, come back to this problem. We said there's a billion endpoints out there. They're growing rapidly. There's four billion identities at least. There's four billion people using the internet somehow. Probably each of them has three or four identities, whether they have a Gmail account and a SIM identity and so forth. There's, I think, meant to be 25 billion IoT devices all have an identity growing to 75. You cannot deal with this scale of problem just on your own. You know, IBM, Oracle, I just don't believe that any one company can deal with the variety of things we need to integrate with the uh, set of systems we need to talk to. So we need open source. And, and you see that. You see IBM and Oracle and everyone using open source libraries in their code, but not necessarily giving back. Now, in some cases, they do. Red Hat certainly do. But y you need it to give back as well as to, to take in order for this ecosystem to build what we need to solve the integration problems of the next century. And I'm, you know, I'm not saying WSO2 is going to do that. That's a big vision. But we're part of that. And we think that's an important give back and part of it. So we took our governance model from the Apache way. And the primary concept of the Apache way is you build a community, and the community builds good code. It's very similar to that thing in the, in the Agile manifesto. You know, the, the right teams build the right architecture and the right code. And we think it's very scalable. You make decisions by consensus of committers, and anyone can become a committer. So anyone who contributes can, can become a committer, but when they do, you have to sign an agreement to say you're not going to start taking your company's code and just wholesale giving it to us. It has to be your code that you contribute. And we think that it goes beyond just open source. And so we are committed to uh, opening up all our source code. So basically, all our products. Um, we're committed to also opening up our financial data. So, so being open about uh, our revenue and our, and our uh, re subscription rates. Being open about our customers as much as they accept that. And of course, not everyone does. Not everyone wants to be a customer reference. But about 300 out of our 500 customers have uh, been willing to be a case study and have been very kind in that way. And that brings a lot of it. And, and you know, a lot of the value is here today. You know, we've had two outstanding talks from customers telling what they've done, sharing what their experiences were. And I know that a lot of you have been talking in the hallways about you know, why you're here. That's very valuable. And, and we also are trying to become much more open to work with partners. So for example, the identity server, you saw that connector store we have around uh, 40 or 50 different connectors in there to different systems. Uh, with Ballerina, we already have multiple connectors. We've been doing webinars with all sorts of other partners uh, on how we work with them. And, and, and we think that, that being part of this ecosystem is really important. And open source creates that level playing field that makes it much easier. And, and finally, we actually encourage all of our team members to use open source as a bootstrap. We have had many, many, I think more than 100, probably 150 of our team go on and do PhDs uh, in, in universities around the world. And many of them have done that based on the fact that they were contributors to Apache projects, committers to open source, that they had published papers openly in peer-reviewed journals. We've encouraged that as a way of saying, look, you know, this is just part of your career. So a little bit about our business model. <coughs> so of course, we build a lot of our own components. But we also reuse a lot of great open source components. And we take all of those pieces and we build them into products. And those products, you know, the, the, I guess the big benefit is that they are providing reusable va value. So 
API management is something that works well in telecoms, in banking, in retail, in finance, in um, uh, transport, in all sorts of industries, and we create something that's highly reusable, and that's our, uh, that's our model, is we want to be reusable across multiple industries and find products that, that give you value. And so what that means is that when one of our customers says, Paul, I really need to add a new token type to the API manager like for my use case, we look at that and we say, actually, that looks like it'd be useful to other customers, and we bring it in. Interestingly, we've often had customers pay us to improve the product. On several occasions, customers have paid us to develop a component that goes into the product. And you might say, why, why are they paying you to do a better product? The other way of looking at it is that they've paid us once to develop this, and now it's part of the product, and we're supporting it forevermore. So they've got a massive value out of that. And we've actually said to people, no, we're not even going to take your money to improve the product because we don't think that's something useful to anyone else. We think that's only useful to you. We'll build it for you, but you have to own the maintenance or, we, or pay us to maintain it because it's not a generally useful product. It's just going to clutter up our, our thing with something that you want and no one else wants. So we're, we're quite picky about that. So we have a bunch of things, as I said, that, that are available to anyone who wants to use it. So obviously you can get download the products. There's no split between the, the community and the full edition. They're all enterprise grade. When you download the product, you're getting what eBay's using in production, what StubHub's using in production, what JLR's using in production, what FNB's using in production. Um, and we do regular upgrades. So we do these updates Every, usually every quarter, occasionally every two quarters, with, um, with, with all the patches and fixes that we've done over, those, over that past quarter. Uh, we have support on Stack Overflow for anyone who wants to use it. We have a support bot uh, using machine learning on our database. Um, and we do provide security updates on the latest version. So we provide free security updates. If there's a, if there's a security problem, we ship an update to say, but it, we don't backport it to all the old versions. And we have a whole bunch of online training and documentation. But of course, you know, we would like you to take a subscription out, and that's where you get these things that Devika talked about, like the 10-year long-term support, a private support account where you can do things, security bulletins. Uh, we, give our, we give customers uh, early access to security updates because there's a sort of funny window where you want to make sure they get everyone gets access and can update the system before the problem's known about. Um, and, you know, a range of consulting services. We give certain uh, customers technical account managers based on how, how big you are and so forth. So there's a whole lot of value, and I'm not really here to sell you on that. De you can go talk to Devika. But fundamentally, we think this is a fair business model, that everyone gets the open source, but we are giving enough value to our customers who pay us that, that it's a fair distribution between uh, what you get for free and what you pay for. And that is a kind of another way of looking at it, that we're trying to give you access to our experts, reduce the risk, give you potentially some public and managed cloud capabilities on top of this so we can manage it for you, and, and really give you that, that assurance that we're going to be there for you and we're going to support this product for you for up to 10 years. And so that model is very simple. Our, all our products are under Apache license. All our documentation is under the um, Creative Commons or Apache license, depending on if it's text or code. And if, you t if you're a customer, then you get the updates and patches, and they are given under a commercial terms license. But as I say, those are... The, everything we give to our customers, you can wait a quarter and we'll roll it up into the product update. We don't hold back fixes from non-pen customers. So we think that our value is more than just the software. We think that our value is our expertise. Uh, I talked earlier about the reference methodology and reference architecture. We think we have a lot of value in, in our wider thinking about these problems. And again, we've done those under the Creative Commons license uh, to encourage uh, people to involve. 
we think we have economies of scale, that we can do uh, a better job of building an API manager than, than, our, than other people can, and, and you can therefore get that for much less than the cost it would take you to build it. Uh, I teach a course at, at Oxford, and one of my students works for a large oil company, and I, one of the sessions was, a, it's about service-oriented architecture, and I did a session on identity, and showed them the identity server, and he was like, all this is free? We're building all this. And I said, well, you're building all that. Why are you building it? Because we didn't think we could get it ourselves. So we're built, they literally built their own OIDC, their own adaptive authentication, all that stuff you just heard Bidura talk about, they built for themselves as a one-off. And it's just not a sustainable model. Even if you're a large oil company and you have massive profits, it's just not a sustainable model. And of course, we reuse a lot of open source too. So we get a lot of efficiency from that as well as being part of a community. So we think it's a, a, a fair exchange of value is our, is our view. And, and I guess that's our, our mantra. We want to be something that customers want to work with. We want us, you to see us as a fair value. And we've kind of put a self-limiting thing there. If, if, if it's not fair and it's not good value, you you're going to go with the open source and, and not pay us. Do you know what I mean? There's, we're not locking you in. So if, it's not, if we're not giving you enough value, you're going to say, sorry, Paul, bye. So you know, that's, it's a, it's a self-limiting model. And you know, we heard earlier we're doing well with cash flow positive. We're growing at 50%. We're now the sixth largest open source vendor and the largest integration vendor. And uh, it, so it's working. You know, and I think Red Hat has also shown that this model can work. We're very pleased with it. And um, you know, I think as Devika said, you know, 14 years ago when we started, this was a gamble. A and we've had a lot of people try and push us and say, you should stop being so open, you can make more money. But we think this is the right model. And, and, and it's not just the right model for code, it's the right model to create a community and an ecosystem and to solve these problems of, of how do you integrate in the 21st century. So I hope, I hope maybe that's changed some of your views of open source or, or reinforced them. And thank you very much. <laughs> do you have any questions? Um, just a quick question. When you started 14 years ago and decided to go open source, what are the key instruments you had to put in place to make sure you build, you know, momentum going forward. So th there must have been a couple of key things that you had, perhaps structures or. I so know. that's really interesting. We inherited a lot of ideas from Apache, and one of the ap ideas we inherited from Apache is that the, the developers are also doing support, are also talking to customers, are also uh, fixing bugs. So w we instituted this thing we call a rotation model. And we have had to modify it multiple times as we've scaled. It's not the, the initial rotation model was just like everyone's doing everything. And we had to put in place a lot more structures. And of course, we do have some dedicated support people now who have usually come from one of the other things. And they may change into something else. But they, they have a one or two years as a dedicated support person because our customers say, look, I need to speak to the same guy I spoke to yesterday. But that's, that rotation model has created a much stronger technical team than I've ever had you know, when I was at IBM or other companies before, because they really understand the problems. And this is one of the things of open source is that you have a mailing list, you directly interact with your users, you begin to, to build up this rapport, and, and especially in middleware. You know, if you're building mobile phone apps, you might be a user of those. But if you're a middleware developer, you're unlikely to need a, a message broker in your everyday life. You're not a user of that, right? So we try and dog food ourselves. We use our own integration technology to solve our finance department's integration challenges, right? So we do that as well. But really knowing your customer through open source is a, is a great way of building that rapport and understanding your use cases better and building better systems. So that was a massive part of it. Thank you. Maybe just to follow up on that very quickly. If you look at your code base currently, what percentage of that code base would you say 
emanates from the thinking from the community as opposed to the thinking from WSO2. So if you had to try and balance that out, what percentage is your thinking, to put it crudely, and what percentage comes from the wider community? That's a hell of a question, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I mean, if you look at, for instance, our API manager, that has a lot of our thinking. It inherited from our identity models, it inherited from a product we had called the governance registry. It inherited a whole lot of our thinking for, for, for you know, 10 years of doing this sort of stuff. But at the same time, you know, where does Swagger come from? It comes from the community. Where does REST come from? It comes from the community. Where does JSON come from? It comes from the community. Where does, um, you know, where do a lot, a lot of these ideas are open standards, open thoughts, and, and we participate in those. So I can't really draw that line. I mean, I think we're so embedded in the open source ecosystem and open standards ecosystem that it's, I, d I don't think you can say, you know, this is all our idea or this isn't. You know, I think it's, it's, it's a co-evolution. You know, there's this weird thing, you know, which came first, the flower or the bee? Do you know what I mean? You know, the, f the flower's no point without a bee. The bee can't live without the flower. So it's somehow they both emerge together and you can't split them out. So I, I just, I'm afraid how I feel about community ideas. Okay, so the shrimp is getting bigger and the whales are, whales are circling. So, I mean, you mentioned Millsoft earlier today, um, and you look like someone that looks forward. Do you have a strategy in place when the whales start coming for you? So, w we've had a few whales come and try and bite us. Um, and so far, we've uh, swum past them. Um, and, and I can't really talk about those scenarios, but I think the, I, I think our, our so, so firstly, I think you know, we'd rather do an IPO than get bought. That's a clear vision that, that an IPO would let, give us the ability to, to chart our own course. So, so that's very definitely our, our vision is to, to ch continue charting our own course, continue creating a company and, and developing that company. We've never had the aim of being bought. We never sort of set up a startup, so we're just going to run for three or four years and, and target IBM to buy us or Red, you know, someone else to buy us. And then, of course, the open source model, where everything is really, truly open source, uh, does give you a lot of freedom. So this is where 4Drop came from. 4Drop uh, came from Sun getting bought by Oracle Nobody, you know, Oracle were going to ditch the product and kill it, and so the committers left, forked the product, and created Fordrock. And, and it's doing much better than Oracle's identity. So, you know, so I think that's the other protection, is that if, if a whale does buy us and, you know, I mean, I, I think IBM looks like they're doing a pretty good job with Red Hat so far. They, they better, because it was a kind of expensive purchase, uh, $34 billion. But, um, you know, I, I think some acquisitions work out well and some don't. And if the acquisition doesn't work out well, then there's a sort of opportunities for our partners, for our committers, for anyone to say, well, that code is in the open. We can take it and deal with it and, and, and take it forward. So, so that's, our kind of, that's our kind of parachute. It's a good answer. Thank you. You're welcome. So this was also the opportunity to reflect on the day. Um, so it is still formally an agenda slot. Um, so just rack your brains. Uh, any other questions? So this, uh, I guess, is just probably more related to all the identity stuff we've been we've been talking about. So I mean, is the is the positioning of the WSO2 identity manager there more on the customer facing side of things versus, say, perhaps your traditional identity management that you know perhaps uh, Microsoft AD would be providing as part of Azure, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a good question. We. We have two quite distinct communities of users. We have people who use it for employees and internal use cases and APIs. So that's typically used much more as part of the integration space. And then we have a separate set of customers who use it as customer identity access management. 
And then we have some that use it for both. So I would say it's about 40% pure CIAM. So we have, uh, there's a 3D design tool called SketchUp. Does anyone use SketchUp? You basically draw stuff online and you can output it to your 3D printer and it'll print it. Uh, that was owned by Google for a while. They sold it to a company called Trimble. Trimble uses our identity access. They're, they're a long time customer of ours. They also use IESB for some stuff. They use IAM to do 20 million SketchUp users. So that's pure customer identity access management. Seagate, uh, that every Saudi citizen has a government log on. So we have around, you know, 70 million, 80 million users in that CIAM space managed through our IAM. But then there's also uh, you know, StubHub and Fidelity and all sorts of people who are using it for more internal use cases and integration. So it's, it's, it's a very versatile product um, and, and really we kind of invest pretty evenly between those two use cases. What's your overall strategy uh, regarding enabling DevOps for your users? So that's a, a really good question. Um, we, we have been building a whole, so, so a lot of our customers already have a DevOps flow, a CI CD flow that they use. And obviously we want to fit into that. But we realized that you know, some of our customers didn't. So we've built a kind of predefined CI CD flow for DevOps for our, that's, that's a, it's, it's not really a product, it's just a set of resources in GitHub, and it's a, a Helm chart actually for Kubernetes, so you can basically go to Kubernetes and say, I want a CI-CD pipeline that installs um, Jenkins as the main driver, but JUnit, various unit tests, some, some deployment tools, and that sets up a predefined CI-CD flow for you for all our products. So our strategy is if you don't have one, we have one out of the box. Our aim is that every new customer, we will either provide them with a CI CD flow or fit into theirs as part of the, you know, as the initiation of the project. So, and we also, I don't know if anyone mentioned our managed cloud, we also have a managed cloud offering. So of course we have a, a CI CD flow for that as well. So if you use us to manage your cloud, then you do a GitHub check-in of the latest artifacts and we have a flow to deploy them into the production system and test them. You, you're about to run out of your quota here. A uh, bit more technical question. So do you have any plans to make the, the API gateway and the integration platform a managed service available on Amazon or Azure in the near future? Because the competitors are doing that, so I'm just asking. So the a both of those are a managed service running on our cloud as a, as a pure SaaS offering. You can deploy APIs and integration flows in our WSO2 cloud on a, on a monthly pay model. Uh, we have a hybrid model, which is, which is more interesting, which is where the management layer lives in our cloud, but you deploy the gateway into your cloud or into your on-premise. And that's more where we're going, is basically to say we can help manage that deployment into AWS and Azure for you in a hybrid model. So, so we have quite a lot today. We also have a, this managed service where some customers just say, look, I want you to run it for me in AWS or Azure, but we, I want to design what it looks like. So that's a sort of slightly more kind of custom thing, but we run it for you, and we do that a lot for about 20% of our customers. Okay, so it's more on demand. So, because what we're seeing is we're seeing the other big guys putting ma uh, full managed service available, mainly due to the data and regulatory constraints. So you could be able, you would be able to consume your platforms as a service then within, uh, let's say, Europe as an ex as an example. Yes, absolutely. But you, what you're saying is not not as a de facto standard. You've got a control plane that, as I say, is with deployment elsewhere. And on a demand basis, you can actually make it available, for example, in Amazon or Azure as a managed service. Yes. Okay. Exactly. Great question, by the way. Thank you. API lifecycle management. So, for example, if you have a um, dev environment, a QA, and a production, is there an automated way of moving an asset on the, on the API manager? 
across the different environments automatically. Yes. So basically we have a, uh, a command line tool that can say I want to export this config and import it. So we build that as part of that CI CD pipeline and flow. Basically say I'm going to deploy a, a staging environment and then I'm going to just take that whatever's in the staging environment and import it into the production environment. For and then the endpoints get changed automatically across yes. the yeah. environment. Fedora, do you want to add anything to that? No, he says I've got it right, so. <laughs> I don't know why I'm the only one standing up here. I guess that's the problem of being the founder. But I thought this Q&A was meant to be for all the speakers, but <laughs> I seem to be the mug here. The opportunity to, to ask further questions and to engage is not fully lost because now is the time for those that have stuck it out for the day. Round number four is over, well done. Um, the cocktails are served downstairs uh, outside the reception, but uh, uh, before I get to that, uh, thank you, Paul, so much uh, for your contribution today and uh, to the WSO2 team for, for traveling out. Uh, I think we've done you proud uh, in South Africa. Uh, Devika mentioned earlier that this has been the best turnout of their summits, summits uh, so far. So to you guys, thank you very much and, uh, and well done. Uh, Devika did whisper in my ear a moment ago that uh, uh, 54 different companies were represented uh, today. And, and, and that I think is uh, it's testament to the traction that WSO2 has achieved in the market already and clearly the interest uh, in the product uh, moving forward. Today wasn't just about WSO2, I think we got a bit broader than that. Uh, but uh, certainly um, uh, exciting. And I know that uh, I was reflecting, Stephen Covey said that uh, the purpose of our lives uh, should be to live, to love, to learn, and to leave a legacy. Um, fortunately, that wasn't our goal for today, and that would have been a bit of a stretch. Um, <laughs> but you will recall. <laughs> 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 but we did set a goal of uh, to learn and uh, to network and, uh, and then to enjoy ourselves. So uh, I hope that that goal has been achieved. If so, then... Uh, uh, my work here today is done. Um, please join us, and uh, when you do leave this evening, travel home safely, wherever that might be. Thank you.